Great, thank you very much. So I'm delighted to be chairing the first panel discussion. And what we're going to be doing with this session is really just looking at the current landscape around asset ownership and some of the current innovations, some of the leading practices and opportunities to really accelerate progress across all parts of the investment community. So I am delighted to um, invite the panelists up to the stage. Um, and whilst they're coming, I'll just introduce them. So we have Eva um, Halverson, the CEO of AP2. Catherine Howarth, CEO of Share Action. Karine Smith um, Ayanacho, um, Chief Corporate Governance Officer, Norges Bank Investment Management. James Thornton, CEO of Client Earth. And Philippe DeFoss, CEO of IRAP. Um, and Vice Chair of the IIGCC. So, um, sorry, no, this is perfect. Oh, well. um, so, what we're going to do is start with Ava, Karine, and Philippe, who are just going to talk a little bit about their own work um, as representatives of three large European pension funds all of whom I think are at the forefront of how do you really understand and integrate environmental risk and opportunity and indeed social risk and opportunity into the heart of investment decision making. So I'm going to ask each panelist in turn to share some insights from their perspective um, and then bring in Catherine and James to take the conversation slightly broader and look at some of the, the other drivers um, and landscape that we're working within. So if I start with, um, I'm going to go to Eva first to share from um, an AP2 Swedish perspective. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to uh, be here and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about AP2 and what we are doing. Uh, AP2 is a Swedish pension fund uh, based in Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. We're managing around 35 billion uh, euros in almost all asset classes all over the world. Uh, we're only 70 people uh, working there, so we're a small organization, and most of the management is done uh, in-house. We think about uh, ESG as a natural part of our overall strategy. Uh, it's, uh, we want to invest in the best companies uh, for long term, so it's natural for us to try to integrate uh, sustainability into our analysis. I used to say the one that has the best information wins, uh, and uh, that applies very much for in introducing or integrating sustainability in our analysis. Uh, before going on to a few examples of what we have been doing and are doing, I'd like to, to just talk a little bit about what I think is important to be successful uh, and absolutely from an AP2 perspective. And that, those are commitment, culture and curiosity. Uh, by commitment, uh, I mean that you have to have a true belief in that integrating sustainability will make your work better. We talk about this at every board meeting, every management meeting, all the time with our uh, staff. And there's a great interest, uh, not only a true belief. Uh, when I talk about culture, uh, at least we feel that we have a strong company culture with a lot of collaboration internally. That means that we get a lot of initiatives when it comes to sustainability from all <coughs> over our organization. And of course it helps with us being just 70 people. Uh, and the last thing, curiosity. Uh, luckily, one of our core values at AP2 is constant improvement. We're never uh, satisfied and that suits very much working with sustainability. We understand that we don't know everything it's a constant learning process, and we do that through academia, research, uh, networks like this, peers, colleagues, etc. And uh, going on to what we have been doing, we have been doing a lot. I will not uh, go through everything on that. We were one of the founding signatories of, of the PRI, and uh, that says something about our uh, early interest in these issues and we have been working with a lot of things but 
I guess uh, a few of my colleagues here will be talking maybe more about the climate issue, which of course is absolutely vital, but uh, I thought that I would mention uh, not a new initiative, but actually a rather old initiative that we have been working with for the last 17 years, since it is the International Women's Day tomorrow. I think it suits extra well, and it's also extra close to my heart. It's something called the Women's Index that we have been uh, producing for the last 17 years. And that is uh, an index that provides facts around the number of women in certain uh, university educations, in, uh, in private companies as a whole, in certain sectors, in the management teams and on the boards of listed companies. And we did that. We started with that as uh, a, a tool to provide facts to the discussion about increasing the number of women in uh, important, uh, in, in leading uh, top managements. And when we started to publish this uh, index, there were 6% women on the boards of Swedish listed companies. Last year, there were 32. Of course, it's not because of us, but we feel that we have provided to the discussion with some real facts. Uh, not fake facts. Uh, more generally, I would say that we have been moving on from uh, working to identify risks to look for uh, opportunities. And a few examples of our latest work is that uh, you spoke earlier of the sustainable development goals. I love them. They give us a common language to talk about what each of us can do. Uh, when it comes to, to the future world. And we have been relating our portfolio uh, to them as a start to, to understand, to think about the portfolio in a different way. And for the last years, we have also invested directly in funds and structures that are aiming, uh, directed uh, towards the sustainable development goals. Another thing, uh, coming back to climate, is that we, three weeks ago we reported on our climate work according to the TCFD, which we support uh, warmly. And uh, as far as I know, uh, last week uh, we launched the report in English, so you can uh, go in and look for it. Uh, we did, as far as I know, we we're the first uh, organization in Sweden <laughs> to do that. And uh, last but not least, we are extremely proud that we have been uh, creating our own uh, ESG indices uh, internally. We have been working with this for a year and a half, and as we speak, we are implementing the last part of it, uh, which means that a third of our portfolio will be covered by those uh, indexes since we have a big quant division. So that's a few words, so maybe two. Please Great. come back to me during the breaks if you want to know anything else. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, and I think that that's um, quite a few things that we might come back to during the, the questions and discussion as well. One thing that you, you touch on there as well, which I think is quite interesting around the, the women's index is separate from finance. There was some quite interesting analysis that I saw that suggests, of course, correlation rather than causation, and I'm not sure how systematic the research was, but that more women in boards equals um, better integration around issues like climate change. Actually, so, more women in companies. Yeah, absolutely. That's well. Yeah. Yep. Um, but maybe a separate discussion. Um, I'm now going to turn to Karine um, and ask you similarly just to share a little bit of insight from the perspective of Nodges Bank to, to get the conversation started. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just saying, you know, this session is called the uh, future of asset uh, ownership, uh, but uh, to say from our perspective, the most interesting future is actually not of us, but the companies we have invested in, because they are really the ones that need to change. And we want to support them on that journey, and in, in that respect, the future is really here and now, because they have started to adapt and they need to continue to adapt. So, so let me tell you a bit about uh, our fund. It's called Norges Bank Investment Management. We're the manager of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, we are now more than $1 trillion under investment. 
and it's really a product of uh, transferring our natural resource wealth into financial assets for future generations of Norwegians. Um, so we are a financial investor and we really have only one mission and that's to safeguard and build financial wealth for future generations. But at the heart of our mandate is responsible investment and actually we aim to be a global leader uh, in responsible investment. Um, when doing that, it's important to remember sort of where the fund is coming from. We really have three, what we say, defining characteristics. First of all, we are large. Um, we have 65% invested in equity. Uh, that actually means we own 1.4% of all listed companies in the world and uh, on average 2.4% of all listed companies in Europe. Secondly, we are global, we invest all over the world, no home buys. We actually don't invest in Norway, uh, but we invest in uh, the rest of the world. And finally, we are long term. As you said, we are there for, in a way, eternity. We are here forever. And because we are so large, global and long term, really we are linked to the development of the global economy. And in that way, we have to think about sustainable in, uh, investment. And we really have to uh, closely follow up what the companies are doing when it comes to that. So just to mention a few uh, quickly how we work with responsible investment. We say we work along three pillars. One we call setting standards, the other we call um, active ownership, and the third we call uh, investing sustainably. And just quickly go through what each of those means. Um, setting standards, that means uh, two things in a way. First of all, we work with policy makers, regulators, in, in setting good standards that work across the industry, sort of raising the bar for all companies, efficient markets, um, and then we also set our own expectations to the companies we have invested in and we do that very transparently, very clear. We issue expectation documents. We of course have one on climate that we've had for a long time. But just to say we also cover other areas. We cover human rights, uh, children's rights, water management, tax and transparency. And our latest we have one on anti-corruption. And we also issue position documents on how we are going to vote and, and, our, and global voting guidelines. So that's what you've done the uh, setting standard side. Um, then our second pillar we call exercising ownership. And that again is also sort of divided into two areas. First of all, it's uh, uh, what we call vote, it's voting. And we will say that um, uh, being a shareholder comes with, of course, uh, rights, but also responsibilities, and we take that very seriously. So our aim is to vote for 100% of all the shareholders' meeting in the companies in which we are invested. In 2017, that sort of translates to 98%, because sometimes they're practical hindrance. But that meant that last year we voted on 113,000 resolutions. So quite a big machinery. Um, but what we see from that, it's actually we see more and more shareholders' resolution on sustainability <coughs> being proposed. And we see it becoming better and we see that we uh, support more and more on those uh, resolution. Also, as a part of our active ownership, we, we have extensive dialogue with the companies we have invested in. And we li like to, to count numbers or, or to see this in numbers. So last year we had more than 3,200 company meetings. I mean, that's a lot. And what we found is in more than 50% of these meetings, we covered extensively ESG issues. So we had meetings, 1,700 meetings where ESG issues were, were discussed in detail. So, so that's sort of part of the active ownership engagement. And the third um, pillar is what we call investing sustainably. And that is really taking ESG information and letting it inform our investment decision. We have a huge database of uh, ESG information and we use that and our portfolio uh, manager use that. But more than that, we also have specific mandate for environmental investments. 
Um, we have currently 9 uh, billion US dollars in, in particular in, uh, environmental mandates that sort of uh, cover various environmental issues and the environmentally friendly activities. And what was interesting to see is last year that had a higher that mandate had a higher return than the rest of the fund. Then finally, there's also some companies uh, we don't want to invest. I mean, in general, we say it's better to be an owner and work with the company than divest than to divest. But there's certain companies after sort of risk-based approach that we say we just don't want to be an owner in these companies, and we call that risk-based divestment. And uh, by the end of last year, we had divest from 216 companies based on ESG factor and a risk analysis. And then, uh, as many of you may know, we have also what we call ethical exclusions. Uh, the Ministry of Finance have set um, some guidelines for observation and exclusion. And basically, given a set of com um, companies or products we should not invest in and certain conduct that is not acceptable, and we exclude uh, companies on that basis. But just some final words, is if I'm going to leave you with sort of one thought on um, what's important for us as, as a long-term global uh, manager, large manager, is that we need better reporting from other companies. We like to say we want to go from words to number, and that's particularly in the ESG areas. I mean, on climate change, we saw last year that only 42% of the companies in high-risk sector reported to CDP, and that's clearly not enough. And we began, began many years ago um, to assess disclosure by the company in the climate area, and we realized we need better numbers. So what we say is we, we sort of don't need more, what we say, non-financial data, but we need more pre-financial data, data that will translate and into financial data as the time go, go on. And in that way, our portfolio manager can be even more efficient in integrating ESG data in their investment decision. So just to sum up where, where we want to go uh, going forward is to support our companies in relevant disclosure, engage with the companies on ESG issues, and finally using the data gathered to, to enlighten our investment processes. And we'd like to invite others to do the same. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Karine. Um, Philly, turning to you finally from a pension fund perspective, um, maybe you could share some of the, the insights from your approach, whether that differs is similar to, um, I suspect, a few similar themes, but, um, but also some differences. And I believe that there are some yep. slides um, that should be showing yeah. as well. Thank you very much. Um, the title of this session is quite explicit, The Future of Asset Ownership Opportunities for Sustainability. And uh, before talking about the future, I would like to um, say a few words about where we are today on what kind of obstacles we have had to overcome and unfortunately still have a head to deal, still have to deal with. So uh, I would say that there are three uh, words to, uh, to sum up uh, this situation we, we, of this legacy. Complacency, lack of transparency, and lack of understanding. So, complacency, this is the first slide, if we um, can have it. Can we get the slides up? Yes. Okay, so the next Great, one. Great, perfect, thank you. So, complacency, uh, because uh, although pension funds are uh, asset owners, they are not asking much from their investing. This is the sad truth. So, our, as our investee have been uh, able to enjoy uh, quite an happy life uh, in the so-called uh, infamous uh, gravy train. And uh, this was complemented by also complacency where there are asset managers for uh, which they were not asking much. So uh, the question is uh, still up today. Uh, how many pension funds have uh, set up uh, um, a, um, guidelines for their investment principle? Uh, that would be interesting to ask for. And how many pension funds have also made mandatory uh, for their asset managers to implement those uh, principles of investment? So this is the first uh, issue we still unfortunately have to deal with. 
And the uh, lack of, of transparency is um, on the, this uh, second slide. Um, unfortunately, still something we have to deal with. Um, it's improving, but uh, uh, this uh, drawing, uh, you know, was not that far um, ago still uh, valid, you know. Um, companies were not used to provide uh, data and reporting to their um, uh, investors. And unfortunately, this, um, this joke about shareholders being stupid um, you know, was sometimes uh, shared by many, many asset managers. Uh, and uh, you all know this uh, uh, infamous uh, quote about uh, dumb money. So this is the second point, uh, unfortunately, that sometimes still exists. But I think the, the third one is even more um, um, a problem because it's how we investors are considering our own responsibility in investing. And uh, unfortunately, the motto is still lost but together, like, in, like we were used to say when we were in the army. We don't know where we are going to, but uh, the principle and the, main, the most important is to be as close as together as possible. This is the basic concept of tracking error. So we have still those issues to deal with. Short-termism, uh, I guess we will come back on that. Mm -hmm. Benchmarking on fiduciary duty. And a very weak understanding of fiduciary duty. So the good news is uh, that uh, times are changing. And uh, this change is due to a very, very powerful uh, currents. First of all, um, the very notion of fiduciary duty is, uh, is evolving. And it is, is, it is evolving because people from the business are starting to make clear that, for example, climate change is a risk not just for the polar bear, but for the business. And this is one of the main achievements of this uh, risky business report that was released a few years ago. Because when you have people like uh, Hank Paulson, Tom Steyer, and Michael Bloomberg with quite strong credentials in the business that are saying, yes, climate change is a risk, it's very difficult for a pension fund manager to say, well, I didn't know. You know now it's, it's very public. Uh, the second uh, driver for this change is, um, you know, uh, there is a demand for more transparency. Be it mandatory, like in uh, continental Europe, especially in France with Article 173, or because the very notion of fiduciary duty uh, makes possible now to say uh, you have to provide this uh, data. And maybe the strongest current of all is the millennials. Uh, my kids, for example, are very uh, sensitive average much more than I was when I was their age. So that's the good news. So why do on uh, at Eraf, uh, we take that into account? It's also because we are just a pension fund. And when you are a pension fund, you are getting contributions that you invest in assets that will be the ultimate guarantee of benefits you pledge to pay in quite a distant future. Someone who is 20 today will actually see the result of our investment decision in 40, 50, 60 years down the road. So it means that we have to take into account in each of our investment decisions whether or not the company we are investing in is addressing the challenges that will make it thrive or not in a, in a two degrees world, for example. So, I think all large institutional investors, and especially the biggest ones, they, they are dealing with that issue. We have nowhere to hide. We cannot say we're going to invest in just a small part of the economy, especially <coughs> when you are managing uh, hundreds of billions of euros. So our challenge is to invest in companies to, to, uh, uh, that are really addressing those issues. And how, how can we do that? Is by engaging. Engaging through uh, collaboration. Uh, I am the vice chair of IIGCC, which uh, stands for Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. 
and with uh, our uh, sister organization, Cirrus on our AIGCC in Asia. We have, for, for example, been instrumental in uh, launching this uh, Climate Action 100 Plus, which is a, a huge, huge initiative. We have, uh, I, I cannot keep track of <laughs> the numbers because it, they are changing quite fast, but uh, uh, I, I guess the last um, account was 225 with 26 trillion euro of asset under management. And when all those people are delivering a message that now they want data, they want figures, they want a, a, a collaborative dialogue with the companies, they are listened. And I think this is very important. And then after, we will maybe discuss later how more effective we can make that engagement. Is it through divestment uh, of stocks, which is just transferring the risk from one balance sheet to another? Or is it, for example, through sending a clear message to the people who are issuing bonds regularly that they should not take for granted that large institutional investors like ourselves will renew their position? Because something that is obvious but sometimes forgotten is stocks don't matter, but bonds do. And it is where we can bite a lot. Great. Um, Catherine, I think maybe coming to you next and two areas that um, I might ask you to touch on. The first one is just a, a few words to reflect on um, some of the points that Philippe's touched on there around yep. that collaboration, <coughs> yep. your sense of where the market more generally is at through the work you do with, sure. with pension funds sure. and other um, representatives from the financial services sector, and then a little bit more about some of the collective engagement and action that um, the asset owner community and, and others are driving. Okay. Thanks. Um, great. Well, I, first, I just wanted to actually say thank you to Ben and for this whole kind of Northern European partnership. I think it's incredibly timely, incredibly positive. Um, some of us that, um, and there's a lot of people have come from different parts of Europe, some of us in the UK do feel like the UK is at risk of becoming a bit of a stranded asset. <laughs> and we do still have quite a lot to offer, but we want to do it collaboratively with other people um, across Europe and actually across the world. Um, so, these kind of initiatives are truly important as a, as a place where we can share learning and become more emboldened because that's what's needed. So I thought I'd just say, actually pick up on some of um, Philippe's points. I mean, what we've got here on the stage are some totally world-class asset owners doing brilliant things, kind of well ahead of the pack. I want to just ground this a tiny bit in a reflection of the fact that by no means is all of the asset owner community at this kind of level. Um, so, but the asset owners are utterly critical. You know, they have the legal duties to millions of citizens with their retirement savings um, who entrust these professionals um, to get it right. Um, they have the long-term horizons, um, you know, multi-decade horizons, and ultimately they have the capital which can be deployed and those capital allocation decisions are probably the most important decisions, and they're decisions made at the asset owner level. Um, but frankly, a lot of asset owners still lack capacity, and we've, we've, you know, a number of people have reflected about how corporations need to go through a major transformation. I think we have to acknowledge that the asset owner community needs to go through a major transformation as far as what does normality, what does normal practice look like, because these are deeply challenging issues and you know it is exceptional rather than normal to have asset owner the CEOs and key people from asset owners saying that ESG is fundamentally integrated into every decision that's not yet the norm and we need to get there um, and it's totally achievable but one of the things it requires is that there is a sort of investment in the capability and capacity of asset owners because historically there's just been too much outsourcing of everything including thinking um, to third party providers who have their own incentives and who have their own much shorter term horizons and so on so you know we we can't afford 
not to really invest in the capacity of asset owners to get um, this right. And I do think there's some really positive developments. So, you know, the, the kind of larger northern European pension funds in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and so on, um, have those capacities and capabilities. And actually, in the UK, some really interesting things are happening. We've obviously got the pooling taking place in the local authority pension fund sector, where we're going to have some much more kind of mega funds with the kind of capability. And actually, pensions automatic enrolment um, is leading to the emergence of brand new institutions that didn't even exist a few years ago. The People's Pension probably isn't in the room. It's got four and a half million members that didn't, it didn't even exist a few years ago. Um, they've come into the sector through pensions automatic enrolment. This is going to be an enormous institution of the future. And they get to write it kind of from new. So, you know, there's lots to be positive about um, the emergence of new institutions in the asset owner space. Um, but the consultants, the asset managers, the data providers, they'll all do what they're told, but they need to have intelligent instructions coming from asset owners. Um, and, and I think, you know, another really interesting sign is um, the Japanese government pension funds doing some very interesting work at the moment, not in Northern Europe, I must admit, but um, around asset manager remuneration and incentives recognizing that if we don't incentivize asset managers to engage with these long-term risks, then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll get what they're incentivized to do, which often is too short-termist. Um, and I think, you know, this is obviously a very share action point, but, you know, we're in a digital age. I think the beneficiaries of today will have high expectations of the institutions looking after their pension funds. And actually, it's a pattern in a lot of the best um, northern European countries that they do have a very lively citizenry who hold accountable their asset owners. I know that you know, sometimes that probably feels a bit annoying, but it's actually part of what makes it all work well. So just a few reflections on a piece of work that Share Action is doing at the moment to try and understand what best practice looks like um, in the asset owner community globally. We're, we're, we're in the middle of um, a series of interviews with 20 of the absolutely best asset owners on climate-related financial risk management. Um, a number of the institutions on the stage have been interviewed um, by us, so I, I won't repeat some of the brilliant things that they're doing. But just a few themes coming out. First of all, the best asset owners are really thinking about innovation and low-carbon investing. You know, we have to allocate capital into the green industries of tomorrow. And that's the flip side of the stewardship that needs to take place with the high carbon companies. But you know, we can't really have one without the other. And I think asset owners um, have been quite cautious about bold capital allocation into green um, tech, into, into green industries. And, but the best asset owners are doing some brilliant work in that space. And we look forward to publishing some of the best ideas that are coming out there. The other thing that's also been touched on a lot is around data methodology and gaps. And you know, it cannot be uh, said too much that companies need to be reporting the data that allows for better uh, investment decision making. And shareholders need to get really active at using their shareholder rights and their shareholder votes to extract the data and ultimately toss off the boards of these companies directors that are not providing the information required to make best investment decisions um, on behalf of beneficiaries. And then collaboration. Collaboration is just critical. You know, I, there is the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the biggest investor, one of the two or three biggest investors in the entire world. Um, an incredibly sophisticated investor, but even you have, you know, 1.4% of all these companies. It's not enough on its own to be impactful. So there has to be collaboration, even if you're the Norwegian Global um, uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, and brilliant to see things like the Climate Action 100 Plus emerging to really um, raise the game in terms of what that looks like. Um, shareholder resolutions are really, really important here because they express shareholders taking the initiative. Now, ultimately, you know, you start with an engagement and you say, we expect the boards of companies to take the initiative around transitioning their business models in line with Paris. But if it doesn't happen, 
then shareholders, I think, have ultimately a duty and obligation to be more active. Dare I say it, activist. Um, and shareholder re resolutions are one really important expression for that. Um, and we're involved uh, in a really, really important resolution that will come uh, to the vote at the Shell AGM in May. And I very much hope that um, all of the asset owners that are serious about this journey will support that resolution. Um, but it's only one example. It, you know, we, we do need to collaborate in a more sophisticated way. And it's coming. It's happening, which is, is great. And this forum and this partnership will, I hope, accelerate that process. Great, thank you, Catherine. There's a few things there around, um, I think, some of the signals that asset owners can provide to the market that I think would be very interesting to come back to. But before we do, um, finally, James, turning to you, um, and some of the work that Client Earth is doing. I think one of the things from our perspective that we see as an interesting connection is, the, is of course, the role of regulation and increasing focus on what the legal responsibilities, duties are, um, and areas where more clarification in law might be required around something like fiduciary duty, which I know the Environment Audit Committee here in the UK is looking at at the moment. And I think you see that interesting connection between greater action by the investment community, which enables greater action by the regulatory community, and then vice versa. So that symbiotic relationship. But maybe a little bit more about the broader perspective of where you see the legal framework currently and some of the drivers um, maybe going forward. Yes, please. And if you don't mind, my, my standing years in the courtroom made me more comfortable please on my do. feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, going back to Ben's remarks, uh, I'm not sure where the, uh, where the bankers and the financial industry will be in a few years, but I was in Berlin last week, and uh, the German bankers were complaining about uh, unfair practices by the French, and here's what they were complaining of. The French are apparently uh, advertising to uh, English uh, bankers in the following way. When was the last time on a beautiful spring day that you fantasized about taking your girlfriend to Frankfurt? <laughs> That's it, a cheap shot. It, it, it is a very unfair shot. <laughs> so um, I, uh, uh, I want to share with you uh, two broad categories, really, of, of ideas about how uh, law uh, can frame the discussion, but also push uh, the, some of the actors in the field. Uh, and uh, those of you who know something about Klein Earth will think of us as environmental lawyers. But for the last four years, we've been investing quite heavily in company and finance law, which uh, turns out uh, to be, uh, I think, one of the most important uh, areas that we, we can work in. But I, I want to start by talking to you about uh, litigation, because it's a very powerful tool. So how can litigation help focus private investment into clean technologies and force governments to act? Uh, our recent experience says it can, uh, and I want to talk about three strands uh, of this work. Uh, the first is to stop investment from going into new fossil fuel in infrastructure, primarily new coal plants, but also oil and gas, since we need to be net zero under the Paris Agreement by, by 2050, and these projects have a very long life. The second strand is to stop existing uses of coal, and the reason I was in Berlin is we're setting up a German office largely to attack existing uses of coal in, in Germany, one of the uh, highest users of coal in the EU. And the third, and the, perhaps the most relevant uh, to today's discussion, is uh, to understand the, that climate risk is financial risk, uh, and how investments need to be managed accordingly. With that overview, let's go for a few moments to coal. New coal plants continue to be built around the world, uh, but new coal plants are vulnerable to challenge when they're built in a country with a well-developed uh, environmental legal framework because it gives citizens opportunities to participate in the decision-making and then to challenge decisions. Uh, in the EU, challenges to both existing coal and new plants can be successfully mounted, and we've been doing quite a lot of it. Uh, only last week, uh, we as well applied to intervene in a case uh, brought against the European Commission by an industry group called Eurocoal. Uh, that case, backed by several German coal companies, uh, is an attempt to undermine tougher new EU regulations on coal plants, which would allow continued investment unsustainably uh, in coal electricity generation. 
Uh, the hope is that by intervening in the case and preventing uh, the uh, German coal companies from, from winning, uh, we allow the framework to develop in the way it's going, allowing for the challenges to both existing and new coal. So it's not illegal to build a coal plant, uh, but um, it should be. Uh, and how can you use existing law uh, when th something isn't illegal? So in, um, in Poland, uh, when we started the organization 10 years ago, Poland was about to build 50% of the uh, new coal-fired power stations that were on the drawing boards in the EU, 14 huge plants which would have perfectly replicated the Soviet energy policies in the 1950s. We challenged each of those investments, and uh, we took a number of cases up to the Polish Supreme Court. And nine years later, six of those have been canceled, uh, and the rest remain unbuilt. And uh, the idea here is uh, that those billions of euros uh, in investment in what would have been new coal-fired power stations become available for uh, investment in uh, friendlier forms of energy generation. Um, Now beyond the CO2 emissions, which is the obvious reason for attacking coal, uh, they are a filthy way of generating electricity. According to the European Environment Agency, about 430,000 deaths a year uh, in the EU are associated uh, with air pollution. In the eastern, uh, central and eastern part of Europe, uh, much of that uh, is coal. Uh, it contributes something in, in the West as well. Uh, air pollution in general, though, uh, has a big impact on the <coughs> finances of countries, and uh, in, the, uh, in this country, uh, the WHO calculated that 3.7% of GDP is lost per year due to air pollution and its health impacts. And again, WHO says that when you go to Eastern Europe, it gets to be over 25% of, of GDP. So uh, we need and have challenged uh, dirty air. Uh, so uh, in the UK, starting in the UK, we brought a case 10 years ago, uh, which uh, has gone up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court issued the first injunction uh, in the environmental arena ever against the UK government in 2015, saying clean up the air as soon as possible. Uh, the government resisted this and has dragged its feet. It's now had to be brought back by us two more times to court. Uh, the last time in the last few months. Each time we've won and the government's been told uh, to clean up the air. There's still much to do, uh, but the government is, uh, is acting. Um, in Germany last week, we, with our German partners, won a major case uh, that will allow, uh, and this was in the highest court in Germany, and it's a big case because it was a challenge uh, to uh, diesel cars and uh, in the central and then uh, the western part of Europe, diesel is the prime contributor to air pollution. And uh, we had brought cases in Stuttgart uh, and Dusseldorf, the heart of the German car industry, challenging uh, air pollution, and uh, specifically diesel. The courts had said that they would issue bans on all diesel vehicles in Stuttgart and Dusseldorf uh, if the air wasn't cleaned in 2018. This was brought up to Germany's highest court. And interestingly, uh, the highest court said these bans are legal under German law. And the, <coughs> the chancellor, uh, within an hour, issued a statement saying this case isn't nearly as important as it seems. Um, and you know when that happens that the case is as important as it seems. Um, <coughs> so these are some examples of ways of uh, using law, using litigation, to move uh, things away from unsustainable activity. We've seen uh, diesel vehicle uh, purchases drop precipitously in both the UK and Germany. Uh, last I saw it was 17% down this year in Germany and 16% here. Uh, so this kind of work uh, begins to signal the end of the use of diesel vehicles and creates a tremendous opportunity uh, to move towards the electrification of the transport system. Uh, what about more consensual uh, uses of law? Um, the uh, company in finance law does offer great opportunities that haven't yet um, been fully explored. And we were talking about fiduciary duties earlier. Uh, what is interesting to me about law in this respect is that it really captures whatever a culture thinks about itself and its mutual obligations at a point in time. 
uh, those understandings of mutual obligation uh, evolve, and they evolve in the realm of facts. Uh, not long ago, a couple of decades, nothing was known about climate change. Now that climate change is indisputable, um, fiduciary duty needs to and is, although a little bit slowly, evolving to take uh, account of it. So that now that we understand that climate change risk is financial risk, uh, the uh, fiduciary duty needs to move. Um, as the legal duties are clarified, investment and other professionals will need to consider the financial risks of climate change in all of their decision making. Uh, this was already adverted to uh, earlier on the, the panel. Stewardship of investments must also play a role uh, in this process. Climate change uh, is arguably a principal risk to the oil and gas sector, meaning that companies are legally required to disclose to investors that the future of their business, particularly after the Paris Agreement, is not business as usual. So we've been testing this. In 2016, we challenged two companies who failed to adequately report possible impacts of climate change on their business activities, Cairn Energy and Soco International. We made complaints to the Financial Reporting Council, who subsequently released revised guidance that makes explicit reference to climate-related risk. Both companies then published better climate risk reporting in 2017. Uh, it was particularly gratifying to hear MPs in the Environmental Audit Committee a couple of weeks ago make the point to the FRC that it was client earth and not the regulator who had spotted these emissions. Now, momentum in this area is growing, and we're excited to see how initiatives at the European level, such as the high-level expert group final report, and the recommendations of the TCFD may lead to legislative change. Uh, again, in Germany, I was talking to senior bankers who uh, were saying that the TCFD um, conclusions need to be made mandatory. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea, uh, and that would help uh, tremendously. Uh, we work in China as well, and the China Securities Regulator recently approached us saying that uh, they would be interested in our input in helping write the new uh, financial, uh, or rather environmental disclosure uh, requirements for all China-listed securities. Now, imagine if China uh, were the first adopter of the, in a mandatory way, of the TCFD uh, uh, suggestions. That would be marvelous. Uh, and in terms of fiduciary duty, there's much more we can talk about, and I need to sit down now. But um, uh, one of the things we're looking at is how to specify within the realm of each of the actors in the uh, chain of investment, so each of the actors, uh, what fiduciary duty means in their daily activities. There's a kind of imagination gap that needs to be filled there from a very high-level statement about fiduciary duty to what it means uh, if you're an actuary or if you're a pension fund manager. And we're talking to the Financial Times now about doing a conference uh, later this year um, with uh, science and fiduciary duty discussion for general counsels of companies to discuss what their uh, actual obligations are in advising their companies, their own obligations, and then what the content of their advice should be. I think there's a tremendous amount of work uh, to be done in actually particularizing of fiduciary duties for each of these professions. Uh, and that will speed things up uh, greatly. Litigation is a great backstop, uh, and it forces things to move in one direction or another. But this consensual work um, is, is vital. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, James. So I'm going to pick up on a few of the points um, that everyone's touched on. Um, and then we'll be coming for any questions um, from the floor. So please do um, have those questions ready. But to start with, if I think of the work that, that A4S Accounting for Sustainability does with the capital markets, so we work with all parts um, of the investment chain. And one of the communities particularly um, is the CFO community, so that corporate side of the equation. And I think one of the things that we still continually hear from that CFO community is that they aren't feeling pressure from their investors. Our sense is that there is a real change starting to happen, a momentum building. So I do think that that is only a matter of time. 
But one of the things that they frequently cite is acknowledgement that at the CEO level, at the senior levels within um, some of the asset managers and pension funds with whom they interact, you're starting to see um, statements being made. You know, one of the examples frequently cited is, is BlackRock, so Larry Fink writing to the companies in which they invest. So signals starting to come through, but when it comes to the interaction at the fund manager level, that they still don't feel that there is any, um, any real pressure, any real sense that um, investment in or <coughs> action that is around sustainable business models, sustainable value drivers, longer term action is really rewarded by the market. Um, so I'd be interested in views from each of you um, around that particular question, both examples of, of actions that you're taking to really make sure that at that fund manager level within your own organizations, that pressure is coming through. But also, any, any thoughts on that as an area where you can really quite quickly maybe scale up action? And, and linked to that, I think that there's an interesting difference psychologically within the companies that, that um, we work with, and I think this is pretty universal, of who is asking the question. So where it is um, an ESG team who may be very well integrated in other parts of the, um, of the investment organization, or a governance specialist, is taken as a very different um, response to if it's what is, is deemed the mainstream fund manager. So maybe Karim picking picking on you first to, to give your reflections on it. I think you've touched on some of the engagements that you do with companies. Um, still a pretty small fraction of the, of the organizations you actually invest in, unsurprisingly, given, given the number of companies in which you invest. But maybe you could say a little bit more about that first. Certainly. Um, first and foremost, um, uh, you know, when we engage on climate issues, first and foremost, we say, it's really a board level issue. You know, we, we need to make the board accountable. That doesn't uh, mean to say we, we're not talking to CFO or CEO, but it has to start at the board level. And, uh, and as a shareholder, we believe, you know, first and foremost, we speak to the board, they're our representatives, and then it has to come from the board and down. And, and uh, as I said earlier, you know, our main engagement tools is really, you know, the dialogue we have and how we vote, in addition to some of the more broader work around standard setting with uh, contributor regulatory um, work. So, so we, we, we say we, we start our engagement with, uh, with the board, preferably with the chair, make sure uh, the engagement comes from there, because then I think if it's the message from the top is the right message, it's easier to drive it through the whole st uh, strategy uh, for the company. Um, as you say, that it's, uh, maybe it's different whether it's uh, the sort of corporate governance specialist or, or the portfolio managers. I mean, we very much integrate our dialogue. Uh, you know, I'm heading up the corporate governance team, but we work uh, very closely with the portfolio managers, so we have a common message. Uh, when we talk to the to the company, mm. and uh, maybe we more engage on the board level, portfolio manager more on a CEO CFO level, but the message uh, is the same. But as you say, maybe we can get better, maybe we can be more persuasive. Uh, but I believe we we sort of with our you know ex expansive uh, sort of dialogue program voting. Uh, at least feel we're making our message sort of reasonably clear. Mm. Eva, um, Philippe, any additional reflections on that of how you're driving it? Yeah, through your I think it's uh, you can you can do this or we do it in different levels. Of course, we also we have big well strategic issues that we bring up with the board. Uh, actually, sustainability is also. Uh, as we are in many uh, nomination committees, it's also always an issue that we discuss when it, look, when it comes to the competence uh, in the board. But I think that equally important is that our equities uh, analysts, they meet regularly with the company, they speak about sustainability, but 
I mean, if you have lousy competence and ask questions on a very low level, see, since you talked about the CFO uh, dilemma, if they are on the same low level, well, uh, it, nothing happens. You have to increase your own competence to be able to really put forward the most important issues, and those should be discussed on a daily basis between the, the, our equities team, for instance. We talk about it, if I draw the line onto, onto our uh, private equity uh, managers, etc. Our uh, risk team is out to meet them, then they talk about sustainability or our uh, uh, reporting team. So we speak about the same issues but from our own uh, professional perspective. I think that's very important that the companies are meeting us uh, in all areas and in all levels. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, two comments because I think your question is raising two issues. Um, the first one is uh, about um, the world you are using about uh, BlackRock and, uh, and uh, Vanguard. They are not investors, they are uh, just asset managers, mm -hmm. no offense, they are agents. Mm -hmm. So they are investing on behalf of asset owners. Mm -hmm. And uh, to come back to what I said uh, previously, the, the main issue is that the number of investors that have set up a clear policy of investment is not that big. Mm -hmm. And it should start here. What are your investment beliefs? How many pension funds, how many long -term long-term investors have, have put in writing, this is uh, the main principle we will invest according to. You can have different weightings for E, S and G, but at least you should make clear to your uh, contributors uh, this is the policy we will implement. And then after the second issue is with um, uh, the schizophrenia of investors themselves, because we are all long-term, but how many of us are able to overcome the annual reporting rhythm? We are still reporting on an annual basis, on reporting on what basis? On uh, benchmarking the performance of our asset management uh, uh, using market cap indexes, which basically are backward looking. They are giving you know, a depiction of the economy as it is today not at all forecasting or trying to understand where we should be uh, aiming at. And uh, this is something we have been trying to work on first because we think that uh, we should uh, walk the talk and stop reporting on an annual basis. Or at least we should complement the annual reporting with providing our contributors with an average for the performance of the last three or five years. How can that be that uh, we are managing uh, liabilities that are in the 30 years duration bracket on reporting on an annual basis. Why should we care? We are managing, in your, in your case, you are managing a perpetual annuity at, the, at 3.5%. So why don't we care? And unfortunately, all the reporting framework, all the prudential rules are based on this idea that uh, uh, we should protect our contributors from uh, volatile the volatility of the valuation on an annual basis. What's the meaning of a value at risk on an annual basis for people who are managing money for the next 100 years? This is absolutely silly. But as long as we ourselves won't be able to convince the regulators that we have to change that, or even our trustees, and it's where I come back to the loss but together, you know, how many uh, trustees um, are feeling comfortable uh, <coughs> Spending a lot of time deciding should we go passive up to 75%, active 25% or should it be 30% uh, rather than 30% uh, active? Compared to how much time we are spending on which benchmark we should ch choose, which is obviously the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are also have to clean our own mess, if I can say. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, it's a... Uh, it's a shared responsibility. On one hand, we have to uh, s s design a policy and uh, make them public in order for our contributors to know exactly what's on, on, on all the elders, uh, elders uh, accountable. 
And secondly, we also have to try to be consistent. We cannot pretend to be managing money for uh, 10 years or 100 years if we are still driving with a, a very sh short-sighted view. Yeah. And I think for me that really does pick up on um, two of the core challenges. One around short-termism, which a number of people have touched on, three, three key challenges. The second, as you highlight, for a, for a company, often it is that interface with the manager mm -hmm. rather than with the owner. And that is the thing that drives a lot of the signals. And for many asset owners, they absolutely have not adopted those kind of principles. So over, although they may talk about long-term investment, um, they still look at quarterly performance. And you know, a number of managers talk about being hauled into the headmaster's office. So you may have a conversation on one level about long-term performance, but you're being monitored quarterly, let alone annually. Um, and that, I think, drives some fundamental problems in the relationship. Although, again, I think interesting examples of the shift there. It also links, if I think of the, the, the comment that you make there around trustees and, um, and pension fund chairs, one of the things we've just set up is a network of pension fund chairs to share some of the examples of action. Because certainly what we find is that a lot don't hear from others about almost the art of the possible. So actually examples of how others are getting comfortable taking action. And I think that comes back to that conversation also of fiduciary duty, which one would have thought had been um, clearly stated in most jurisdictions, that you have a duty to consider these issues, that there's clear signals. Just take most recently TCFD and the Financial Stability Board. And, and your example of risky business, very clear signals that certainly when it comes to issues like climate change, it is about financial issues. It's not about social or environmental. So, Maybe yeah. Just to, to, to complement on what you said, um, the way we are understanding uh, the world sustainability is not the same when you are 20 or you are 60. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, before uh, getting rich with oil in Norway, they were fishing. So they have a clear understanding of what sustainability means. If you fish too much for too many years, at the end you won't be left with any fish. If you are 60 and very close to retirement, you know, you can uh, invest in companies without paying too much attention to their ability to, to thrive uh, in the future. And it's the reason why I think it's so important to make clear information and deliver clean information to the young people because as I said before, the assets we are investing in are the ultimate guarantee that we will pay or not pay them pension and that by investing we will make possible for them to still be roaming around in a living world or not. Yeah. Catherine, maybe looking at the, the whole question also of debt finance, I know that's an area you've been doing a lot of work on. I think some of the conversations have been touching on the more the equity side of the equation, and um, particularly where it comes to getting in place some of those infrastructure of the future, um, and really looking at how some of these issues might impact future cash flows. I think it's an area that you're starting to see a real shift happening. So is there anything from the work you've been doing there that you Yeah, can well, share? I mean, I, I'm be a bit humble about the work we're doing. It's sort of preliminary, but we do do think that um, the responsible investment discussion has been very equities heavy. And um, whilst that makes perfect sense in the sense that shareholders have, you know, critically important and valuable rights underused a lot of the time, um, principally the right to vote in or out of boards people that you deem competent to, to manage your capital risk um, as an equity holder. But actually, modern capital markets, companies are not actually coming for equity very much um, uh, to capital markets. They're debt financing themselves a great deal. And actually, asset owners need to do a bit more to sort of join up the dots between their debt teams and their equity teams. I really think, in a, in a smart way, what is the transition journey that we want these companies to go on um, so that they are both at a stock and individual company level, you know, safer for the long term, but also that their impacts more broadly are sort of c 
consistent with the long-term best interests of our beneficiaries and how do we um, join the dots between um, our, our, you know, all of these high carbon companies are constantly refinancing their debt. Where are the asset owners saying, well, actually, we're going to have some conditionality now. We will um, refinance those debt programs if you are showing Paris compliant business models. I mean, that would be sending such a fantastic signal into corporate board boardrooms. Um, and actually, I, I think the other side of the equation, which we have been doing a lot of work on, is um, bank financing. So, uh, particularly on the kind of where are the green industries of tomorrow getting financed? Some of them are coming to capital markets and, and doing IPOs, but most of them are going to banks. It is really important that asset owners with holdings in the banking sector are asking smart questions about the carbon intensity of loan books, about the transition plans of bank boards, um, because I think that's one of the really key unlockers of the transition um, and, and you know there are some really fantastic developments i we had a, a an event on that um, theme in this building um, three or four weeks ago i'm delighted that norges bank and others were um, represented and are, and are really engaging in fact the statements that norges have put out on the banking sector and climate risk are very sophisticated and interesting but you know that collaboration is needed because no, no one holds enough bank stock. And by the way, when it comes to the banking sector, they, of course, are really important service providers. So we need to, again, join up the dots. Yeah. Why are we giving business to sell-side analysts that aren't totally focused on this transition um, journey? Um, so I think there's just this amazing amount of power that the asset owner community holds. And you know, they've got all the cards in their hand but do need to be more bold and collaborative um, about using them. So the, final, the final question that I just wanted to, to touch on um, before we ask the questions from the floor is, is picking up on that strand of disclosure and, and standardisation and whether you have the right information for investments in this kind of area. I think each of you in different ways have touched on maybe alluding to um, a gap that continues to exist in the quality of disclosure. Maybe James first coming to you. You've obviously, the example that you gave around um, the FRC suggests that actually a lot of the, the reporting frameworks are potentially there. Mm -hmm. but just not being enforced? Yeah. Um, or whether you think that there is still a gap? You, you also touched on the, um, the German banker example of saying mm -hmm. TCFD needs to be mandatory. Mm -hmm. so a little bit more. Yeah, I think both. I think what is there isn't, uh, isn't often being well enforced, and there needs to be more. So, uh, I mean, imagine a world in which the, uh, the TCFD uh, suggestions for what disclosure should be, particularly their scenario planning, uh, was actually made um, mandatory. Uh, that, would be, that would be marvelous. Uh, if it was made mandatory, uh, then the uh, FRC, which is a pretty lackadaisical organization, I have to say, um, uh, would be required to uh, enforce it. And then people in the community that were interested in enforcing it would have the opportunity to enforce as well. I mean, we do enforce things, but if there were more to enforce, it would push things further. And I, I had a question for the, my co-panelists, really, which is I, um, I, I often think about uh, the uh, question uh, that you were raising about um, this uh, long-term uh, investment horizon. Everyone has touched on it in, in different ways. But what would make the breakthrough happen uh, from, from your perspective? Is it, uh, is it a combination of uh, you know, better reporting uh, and legislation mandating long-term horizons or, where, where, or this cooperation? Is it all of these things? Uh, where could a breakthrough be made? Where should we be focusing our activities? Well, uh, our Japanese colleague, uh, Hiro Mizuno, uh, at the Milken Institute uh, two or three years ago, uh, was discussing with some of our colleagues, uh, Chris Elman from uh, CalPERS, and uh, they were maybe uh, 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 proposing uh, some sort of uh, initiative that uh, could be, um, that could pull some uh, very large institutional investors saying, we won't report anymore only on an annual basis because it's not consistent with uh, duration of our liabilities. We are managing for the long term, so, so we have to provide 
something that is consistent with that. So that could be a consensual uh, initiative bringing together some uh, very large uh, players. And uh, if it's not enough, maybe at some point, uh, maybe uh, regulators could uh, make mandatory for pension funds people to provide reporting that are more consistent with, uh, with the duration of their liabilities. Once again, it does not make sense uh, to, to be paying too much attention to the blips of the markets when you are managing. Unfortunately, it's embedded in the regulation because yes. Uh, the regulators have uh, adapted, uh, between brackets, the Solvency 2 approach to uh, people who are managing money for a very long term. Uh, solvency is not bad per se, because uh, if you are uh, promising to send the money back to your uh, uh, clients uh, every day, when, whenever they want, uh, volatility is obviously a risk. When you are managing money for 30 years, on, uh, if on top you are on a net positive cash flow basis, it doesn't make sense. And at some point, maybe we should also uh, envision the possibility in case of stress to open repo uh, uh, to uh, pension funds in case they are so stressed that they cannot just make good on the, uh, the promise they have to pay for one year, rather than to make mandatory for them to sell assets at the, at the worst moment. Mm -hmm. The regulation is very proactive, uh, pro-cyclical right now. And, uh, mm -hmm. So it's a common issue and uh, the more we are to, to raise that issue, maybe uh, we will be able to change that. But let's, let's start to walk the talk mm -hmm. and take an initiative, taking together large institutional investors. May, maybe just a point on um, um, regulation because uh, um, I was really struck by the fact that with the car exhaust uh, test, we discovered, uh, we knew, but we had the vivid proof that uh, corporates who are investing, invested in are spending millions of euros, 10 million of euros, to fight against things we are trying to, to get in mm. Brussels. Mm. And frankly, uh, talking about engagement, there is also a huge issue with engaging the regulators and the people in Brussels because, frankly, the car exhaust testing were uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it's a disgrace. Mm -hmm. For years, they, they knew that uh, it was a fake uh, because you know how it was happening. They were putting a car on uh, cylinders and, and, and it has been lasting for years. And uh, mm -hmm. you have many lobbyists uh, that were mobilized to defend that with our own money in mm -hmm. some way. It's mm -hmm. corporate mm -hmm. money. So it's very imbalanced. Uh, you know, as I said, I'm the vice chair of IIGCC. We would like to raise the fee. <laughs> it's very difficult. But, and we have a very modest budget. And we have to fight with uh, the big uh, car uh, mm -hmm. makers mm -hmm. that are spending a lot of money. Just to maintain, you know, the, the emissions at the level they were. Mm. If that's the reason why we had mm. for so long a time diesel and cars that were actually delivering uh, ten times more mm. exhaust than uh, the official figures. Oh, well, yeah. they still are. Um, so here's, here's a project. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, a large percentage of the of the assets in the world on the stage. Um, <laughs> how about a, a, a cooperative project to uh, to buy a majority share in Volkswagen? and uh, make a change. Something to come back to. I think we need <laughs> to um, come to the floor. And so there's a question um, at the back there, and then um, one at the front here. So I'll take both. Um. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I have a um, remark on the last question that was just thrown out. My name is Sandrine dixon Declev. I wear a variety of different hats, but today I'm here representing E3G as a senior associate. And, and the reason I say that I represent different hats is because I actually was with VW last week trying to have exactly that conversation. Mm. Um, and what we try to do at E3G and also in the different types of responsibilities I have is as we're in the trenches, we're trying to create that journey towards a transition that Catherine actually just mentioned, which I think is a fabulous way of putting it. So my question to all of you, because I sit on an aluminum board as well as on a startup in green chemistry, is how do we ensure that journey? Is it more through the divestment opportunities, 
which is what everybody talks about, or the positive investment, or a mix of both, which is kind of you divest in fossil fuels, but as long as you demonstrate diversification or investment in something else, we will continue to work with you. And the reason I say that is that we have a problem right now, for example, in Brussels on innovation policy, where most of the funding is going to startups and new technologies. But we're forgetting the primary sectors. And the primary sectors, the aluminum sector, if you look at Norway, for example, and North Hydro that just put up their new plan, are trying to shift. Look at what we've just seen from the United States in terms of trade wars. How are they going to be able to really shift if now most of their material is going to get blocked to one of their major markets? We need to think about how we maintain the primary industry and help them shift but by the same token, get out of those most polluting industries. So it's a question to you as to what are the best tools in order to do that within the financial toolbox. Thank you. Okay, and then um, Anthony, if you could share your question now as well, and then we'll come to the panel with answers. Uh, Anthony Hobley, uh, CEO of the Carbon Tracker. First comment is very much in a personal capacity. We opened with Brexit. I think it's dangerous to assume Brexit's inevitable. Um, there is a chance of stopping it, and we've got to acknowledge that and prepare for that as well. But to the point that was raised, I think, by the panel, drawing together, I think, a number of comments. Um, we're very much focused on the green, but we cannot forget the brown. I think this was coming out in a number of the points made. Any, the tracking that we do through financial analysis and otherwise, we have to start looking at both sides of the equation. I mean, in, in a sense, it's great that we have X growth in green bonds, that a certain company is investing more in clean energy renewables, but if, if at the same time investment in brown is not being looked at and is not going down, then we're not winning. It's a simultaneous equation, and you can't really assess what that equation is telling you unless you're looking at both sides of that equation. So perhaps we could talk a little bit more about that, how we achieve that. Okay, great. So, um, who wants to answer the first question? Either. Uh, well, actually, I think they are touching upon the same uh, thing. Uh, this is one of my fears going forward, that uh, the, the transformation is seen as black or white, that there only are the sacred uh, green investments that we should look on. Uh, we have been or are working at, at both uh, sides of the coin here. Uh, the divestment that we have done from uh, fossil companies, etc., or from those companies that we know after dialogue, or we feel that they don't have a plan for change. But if the companies have a plan for change, I think it's very important that we as investors support them. And we can do, I'm coming back with, uh, to the, the knowledge uh, part again, we need to increase our own understanding to, to prevent this issue from being black or white, or from being green and brown. <laughs> and and just, just, just to sort of follow up around that, which maybe picks up on um, Anthony's point as well, one of the things with the TCFD reporting requirement that I think we're seeing really helps to drive that shift and maybe um, picks up on, on, on both of the questions, but is the scenario analysis piece, firstly, and secondly, asking all actors in the chain to do that kind of analysis. So I'd be interested, you, you mentioned that you've just um, gone through your first um, reporting against the TCFD requirements. As a pension fund around that scenario analysis piece, did you feel that you had the right kind of information or ability to do the assessment, the analysis, on scenario analysis, um, looking at that transition question? Of course not, from a broad perspective, that's why we take part in a lot of cooperation, uh, wanting better reporting, uh, but the better reporting must be met uh, from us being able to analyze the reports that we get. Karine, you were keen to come in there as well. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Do you divest or, or how do you work with the companies or do you tilt your investment? And um, just to say, yeah, we do, we sort of do, do a bit of both. In the sense of a starting point is that we want to work with the companies. We want the companies to take, be a part of the solution. And, and that is absolutely the starting point. 
so we don't just uh, you know invest in the sort of good green companies. It's really about being part of working with the companies to tackle the future. Um, but having said that, you know, first of all, we have an ethical screen on, on certain companies, including uh, companies uh, in, in uh, coal, uh, or majority at least. Um, but also, we, we just say there's some companies, even, even maybe after engagement, as you were mentioning, that we just think that these companies are just too risky. They're not going to be part of the solution. And some of these companies would also say, you know, we, we are just going to divest. So we are sort of a mixture of, of both, really. But, but um, I would say most of our work is really to work with the companies. And I think that is what's going to change uh, you know, the, the world in a way uh, by working with the companies to make the companies become part of the solution. Maybe one way uh, to avoid, uh, to have to divest at some point is not to start by investing as a first instance. And it comes back to what kind of benchmark you're using. If you are using a market cap, you are invested in all the companies of the investment universe. So at some point, you realize that uh, maybe you are not comfortable with that company. So it's just to say that if you have um, designed this uh, investment policy that um, your trustee thing is uh, consistent with your mission, Maybe you will avoid investing uh, in companies you are not comfortable with. Uh, at Yerraf, what we have been doing for many years is just to start, it's a no, no rocket scientist approach, just ranking every company in each sector in the economy according to the way they are addressing ESG. And uh, the bottom quartile is excluded. So it's not to say that the free card quarter left uh, will always be uh, you know, uh, good companies. We are in a, there are 50 uh, shades of grey. You know? it, uh, it's a continuum. Uh, it's not to say that uh, they are the, the best of the best, but they are better than the others. And I think it's, it comes back to what, what should be the first step taken by pension funds or long-term investors. What's what is the investment universe you want to invest in? Is it, do you start with uh, the universe as it is, considering that uh, market efficient theory is still valid, although we have been demonstrated many times that it is not work? But as long as we are unable to zoom back and, and reconsider the way we are uh, addressing those issues, we, we, we are going nowhere. And I think you're starting to see more funds, more pension funds, feel comfortable with that kind of approach. Yeah, um, because yeah. when you are big, at some point, you cannot implement uh, uh, ESG policy or sustainable investment policy without implementing some sort of best in class, mm -hmm. I think. Because you are just too big. You cannot just say, I won't invest in that sector. You are investing in the world economy, you just want to avoid the worst of the worst and try to, uh, com um, to invest in the best or the better uh, actors in each uh, sector. Any other questions? So, um, if I come to those three there. Thank you. Alex Bakawi, Council on Economic Policies. I wanted to follow up, uh, Philippe, on your comment on pol political lobbying of companies because I think you're absolutely right, but it's also a very weird situation that the companies you own spend more money than what you can spend even though you own them. And I've always find it striking that I think we do so little in the ESG world on that topic. And I'd be interested what asset owners do on that. How accountable do you hold companies in aligning their lobbying activities with their sustainability principles and what possible next steps could be? Great. And then there were two other questions, all in a row. Yeah. Thank you, um, Katya Paramanova. I'm from Moody's. Uh, this is the uh, question to the um, to the entire panel, really. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty that's associated with the long-term um, outlook, and uh, this is uncertainty uh, regarding the pace of change. I think um, assets like coal are a bit more clear-cut, where we know that coal um, plants will be uh, getting phased out uh, by 2025. But um, things like 
oil infrastructure um, is, is a bit less clear cut. So I think it's fair to say that we just don't know how quickly and how dramatically oil demand will drop, drop off or will start to drop off in the next 20, 30 years. So this uncertainty um, creates challenges perhaps even to the most competent and forward-looking um, investors and advisors. So how do, how do you respond to this uncertainty uh, today uh, when you're making those long-term um, investment allocations? Thanks. And final question. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, Peter Wheeler, um, the Nature Conservancy. We're a conservation NGO and a large endowment asset owner. Um, the conversation here is about uh, sustainable finance. I think almost all the discussion has been about climate. And so my question to the panel is, we look, look at other aspects of sustainable finance, particularly other natural ecosystems, how they're building back into their uh, investment decisions today. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so who wants to take the lobbying question? Catherine? Well, I'm happy to. Because um, I think it's absolutely fantastic issue. It is one that actually is beginning to get a bit more attention. So um, there was in the news this week that um, there's a resolution being filed at Rio Tinto on exactly this issue, which is excellent. Um, but I think it goes to the, to the point I was trying to make earlier about how there's a sort of dysfunctionality in how asset owners generally do not have the capacity and capability and haven't given themselves the resources, human resources, to manage their own service provider supply chain because too much of the time the service providers are running rings around real capital owners um, and that is a real challenge and ultimately one in which beneficiaries I think this goes to Mark Carney's points on on the, the risks of which legal liabilities are one of the climate risks but I think that we will see um, beneficiaries at some point saying why are my fiduciaries not more on the ball about these kind of contradictions where we've got our own investing companies lobbying against positions which are being taken to defend, to defend my best long-term interest. So that's just, a, it's, a, it's one example of a sort of deeper problem, I think. Um, and then I just wanted to get to the really interesting question about uncertainty. There is radical uncertainty, I think, but that's why the Paris Climate Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, are these create a roadmap around which asset owners can start to make decisions. Um, and it is a little terrifying and it calls for real leadership behaviour, which says we're going to asset allocate towards that goal, even though you've got you know, Chevron announcing this week that, you know, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. There's going to be a decarbonisation. We're going to thrive. We're going to sell all of our carbon assets. We have to say that's wrong, but there is a sort of leap of faith required, and that's what real leadership looks like, I think, in the asset owner community. But no one else in the global economy can do it. Um, and you've got the best in the world sitting here on the stage, and we need to replicate that behaviour and build it. And collaboration between asset owners is going to be the name of the game in the next few years on this. Um, so, Philippe and Karine, and then I will come to James and Eva for just final comments. So, um, but also picking up on Peter's point on... Um, uh, quite rapidly on uncertainty. Uh, I'm not so sure there is so much uncertainty. From a very financial point of view, uh, there are things we know for sure. Uh, the price, the marginal price of renewable is going one way, down. Solar price is going down. <coughs> what will be the speed at which we will reach um, that level, I don't know, but it's going down. The price on the uh, thermal coal power plant, maybe it's fixed. Yeah. Nuclear power, power plants, it's increasing because there are safety reasons with the current mm -hmm. technology. So from a very basic uh, financial point of view, you have to think twice before committing capital for 25 or 30 years because when you are financing a thermal power plant, you are committing capital for and uh, uh, making uh, uh, um, financial returns calculation on this basis because uh, if down the road 15 years uh, ahead, you there is a political decision or a change in prices that say, well, it's over, 
what will you do with your thermal power plant? It will be quite difficult to convert it in a nursing home or an hospital or whatever. So you will, it's a virtual stranded asset. So that's the first one. So there is uncertainty, yes, but there are some sort, there are some things we can consider as, you know, almost uh, sure. And about um, lobby, I think, once again, I'm not uh, make, uh, sending a commercial for IGCC, but it's funny sometimes we say, should we raise the fee by that amount? And some people say, wow, is it not too much asking for more contributors? How much money has been lost by shareholders on uh, VW? Mm. Yeah. And when you are fighting after a class action, on winning, you say, great, we, we get some money. Well, but where does that money come from? <laughs> it's your money. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so can you, maybe you could pick up on the, um, the point that Peter raised of how are you addressing other um, key, whether it's environmental issues like the question of biodiversity and ecosystem collapse or... Um, yeah, certainly. Uh, and thank you, Peter. Of course, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable finance is more than uh, climate. And as I said in the beginning, we, we want to be a predictable owner, so we set out our expectations clearly to the companies and expectation documents. And now we, we have other focus areas than climate. We have expectation documents on human rights, uh, children's rights, and as I said, tax and transparency. And but interestingly, maybe for um, Nature Conservancy, although we, we haven't come up with a document yet on biodiversity, is that we, are, uh, we will come out uh, in not too long with an expectation document on oceans, and that will sort of at least uh, address some biodiversity when it comes to the oceans. And, uh, but uh, of course, in, in, in more broader terms, biodiversity and environmental issues, of course, are very important issues also. So I agree, it's, it's important to not sort of forget the other, other sustainable issues in, in the climate discussions. Okay, so we um, out of time, so I'm going to ask Ava and um, James just to give one closing thought, and particularly coming back to the, um, the whole purpose of the conference. So if there's one thing that you think um, from a Northern European partnership could we be focusing on taking the strands of the discussion in this opening panel together? What is that area of focus that is really going to have a, um, a significant impact? James, maybe you first. Well, uh, for me, it would be uh, continuing the discussion on fiduciary duty uh, and uh, how it plays out in all of the day-to-day uh, -day professional activities of all the actors in the investment chain, from the asset owners uh, uh, through to everyone else. Uh, and it would be great to keep a dialogue going on, on that and to push that very hard because, um, uh, and uh, to bring uh, legal tools in there to uh, not only allow people to see what they should be doing, but to realize what they need uh, to be doing. And then on a completely separate uh, uh, note, uh, it, would be, it would be great to hear from people uh, during the course of the conference and after uh, on um, big investments that aren't uh, being made by the actors on stage and the people in the room uh, I'm very concerned about China's Belt and Road program, for example, uh, has a tremendous in impact on sustainability uh, in the world. Uh, and then we have a trillion investment that's going to be going in there, very different kind of investment. But uh, uh, from the very sophisticated investors here, if there are ideas about how uh, that might be influenced to move in the right direction, it would be very welcome. Ava, final word. Hmm. Uh, that each one of you take your small. Uh, step. Don't think that you have to be Norges Bank or AB2 or anybody else. Uh, try to keep your eyes on your ball. There are so many initiatives right now. That's great. They can inspire you, but don't switch strategy from day to da day. Uh, try to do your thing, and that will help. And glance at the SDGs. They will help you. Great. Well, thank you to the panellists, um, and we'll hand over to the next session. So, thank you.